trying to get myself back to the corner now. <laughs> okay, we're live. They're suggesting to pass it around. So, so I'd like to present John Little. He's uh, the co president of Briggs and Little. He's going to talk about the history of Briggs and Little, which is one of our premier heritage uh, businesses in the area. And coffee is ready. Oh, if we do that first before John starts. starts. No, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's get started. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm especially proud to do this for the. The originator was an extremely good friend of mine who dedicated a lot of time and effort to this organization, and I really hope it can continue for many years to come. Now, when I was asked to do this presentation, I really wasn't sure if it was because I was from York Mills or Briggs and Little or whatever. Uh, although I've lived in York Mills all my life, my historical knowledge isn't that great of that part of it, but uh, I do have a fair bit of experience with Briggs and Little. So uh, most most of my story or talk will be based on Briggs and Little. But I probably should begin with the fact that, you know, a lot of the people who settled here, they came and they were going to be farmers. Well, <clears throat> they all you know, had so long to get started with their grants and do all that and, and get a certain amount done in order to get their clear titles and all of that. Mm -hmm. So there were a few entrepreneurs that were in the group that realized quite quickly that not everybody can be a farmer, like there are other businesses that have to go along with that. And uh, George Lister was one of those people. And I'm not sure exactly how long it was that he was here before he started, but sometime during his time here, he had a sawmill, which I think was his first endeavor and pretty smart move. Uh, and then there was a grist mill, and eventually there was a woolen mill, too. And the woolen mill came 20 years, basically, after the first settlers came to Harvey. So in the context of things, when you think about that, and you know, what they had to work with, that probably was fairly quick. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, now, I don't know, uh, the verbal history of Briggs and Little says that it started in 1857. Uh, and that was a lot of the older people up through the years. Ward Little was one of the people who said that he remembered them talking about that date way back when he was young and he was born, uh, I guess prior to 1900, so. Uh, so with that, uh, there have been several stories done on us, our history, and one of the most detailed ones was done uh, by a writer for the Atlantic Advocate, and he researched quite a bit, and he he found Briggs and Little listed as a business in a census that was done around 1860. So that was three years later, and it was an established business then. So who knows the first year they were going, what they had or what, you know, ex exactly how much equipment or how much they did. But uh, we've always used that date. So, uh, you know, today we're 162 years old. Uh, I guess to start to start with, uh, I believe what they they did was just to process the wool, wash, wash wool, card, and maybe spin it, maybe not. Some people only had it carded, and then they took it home as roving, and then they finished it on the spinning wheel. That was just because their time they were busy doing many things, nothing automated, they had to, uh, they could save time by getting the roadways 
um, and, and finishing off themselves. Now, one of the things that made York Mills so appealing was the Northeast Stream, because at that time, you know, there were only so many means of power, and uh, the stream there provided provided a good opportunity. And I think the fact that uh, there were banks on both sides so that they could create mill ponds and get a storage of water, I think all of those factors uh, worked into the equation because I'm not sure how many years into it, but there were three dams within a mile on the stream. So the water was well worked by the time it got through York Mills. And uh, that was the power that ran at one time, there was uh, two sawmills, two grist mills, and a woolen mill. They were all run within that mile. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they they got power where, where they could find it. Uh, one interesting thing that uh, we learned about, I guess we were doing some project. I'm not sure what it was. But it's uncanny how those people at that time could do their surveying and their measurement things and figure things out. Because the Oliver Brook, which runs out in behind York Mills uh, and ends up crossing Route 3 just, just beyond towards Thompson Corner, they calculated that there was a place in back of York Mills that they could actually run the water from there out to the stream and they could create so that they could use it for irrigation for, for farming. And we actually found part of the trench that they had dug that ended up with that water dumping into the northeast stream just below the woman now. So really, it's amazing what what some of those early people did. So, I guess in the very beginning, the mill was called York Woolen Mills. And uh, it was started by George Lister. And about the first 40 years were kind of tumultuous. Uh, it changed hands. Uh, I'm not sure if he actually went through bankruptcy, but he, if he didn't, he very nearly did. And so took on partners, and then there were people from other places. And at one time, part of the owners were from St. Stephen, and their intention was to stop production in York Mills and move it to St. Stephen. Uh, ultimately, I believe there was, well, I know, there was a mill that was built at St. Stephen, so... Maybe the plan didn't work out to take the machinery from there, so they so they built their own. And uh, actually, one of the people who worked at that mill was uh, a person who had worked at Briggs and Middles for quite a few years in helping set the machinery up. So this back and forth went on for a few years, and the first owners that sort of started to create some stability. Uh, was Ellick and Roy Little, and they, somehow they're related to my grandfather, I'm not sure if they're a cousin or an uncle, or, well, I guess there's two generations there, so it could be both, but uh, they bought the mill. Now, according to records, it was, there had been a fire, and I don't think it was total, but whatever the case, they began working on the mill after a fire, is, is what some of the records say. And some of these things that I'm telling you uh, will be a little bit ambiguous uh, because I don't exactly know all the details, but my sister-in-law, Heidi LeVere, is writing a book on the history of Briggs and Little and she has researched for about five years. She's really hoped the book would have been out before now, but she's had some problems with uh, inflammation in her arms and shoulders, and she has flare-ups where she can't, she can't even type or whatever. So she's 
it's kind of delayed her in releasing it, but she's still working on it, and it's going to come out. And I can tell you that she has told us several things that I never knew, and I, I've never heard from anybody there. So it is going to be accurate and detailed, and I can't wait to see it because it's uh, it's it's going to be the Gospel truth, but <laughs> where it breaks a little bit from. We'd like to sell it here in the, in the uh, heritage. Mm -hmm. I'll make sure you can get some copies. Yeah. So it was around 1900 or a little bit after that Roy and Alex bought into the mill and started rebuilding. So I'm not sure exactly when they started producing, but I do <clears throat> know that they were. Uh, making yarn by 19, 1909, because I just showed Ray and Shirley here. I have <clears throat> the oldest copy of something from Brixton that we have, and it's a receipt written out by Roy Little in June, on June 28, 1909. And it's, it's the pricing, and I'll just Pass it around, and if you didn't bring your reading glasses, I'm sorry. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, they say that uh, they're not teaching writing in school anymore. Right? Right. Yeah. That is a man's writing, and you won't you won't believe it. <laughs> so Roy and Alex were father and son, and they worked together in the mill for a few years and poor health caused Alex to have to move away. He, I, he had tuberculo, uh, tuberculo, whatever it was, he needed a drier climate. So they recommended that he move to Alberta or Prairies, whatever. So he did. And his son Roy stayed on, who coincidentally, his wife's name was Francis. <laughs> which happens to be my mom and dad's uh, and they both they both were there at the mill some because I know we've seen pictures of her in the office uh, but <clears throat> Elliot left in 1913 and Roy ran it until 1916 and then I think there was more health issues in the family and he decided that they, they were going to move west with the rest of the family, so the mill came up for sale. And my my understanding is that uh, my, I don't know how many great grand my <laughs> grandfather's father, great great grandfather, who I'm named after, called my grandfather Howard at, he was working on the railroad in the cabin at the time and said he had heard that the woman mill was going to be up for sale if he was interested in running that, uh, he should maybe try and find himself a partner and, and maybe take over the mill. So he decided that was what he was going to do and uh, he chose Matthew Briggs who at the time was the manager of the Farmers Trading Company uh, which is Watson Store now, um, back at that time. And he had worked as, as a manager, so he came in and he worked in the office, and my grandfather worked in the mill. And so they bought it in 1916, and <clears throat> I understand they had to do quite a bit of traveling. It wasn't as easy to uh, get a name and a company registered then, and... Uh, Anyway, I think it took them about a year before it actually became Briggs and Lou, like right? as a registered <coughs> proper name. Uh, in the interim, from York Woolen Mills, for a short term, Roy and Alec Little called it Little's Woolen Mills, and I think that's what's on that paper that's going around now. Uh, <coughs> so. My grandfather, Howard, and Matthew ran the business, and we're doing, we're doing quite well at it. And in 1935, 
So, but a little less than 20 years after they started, uh, Matthew Briggs died very suddenly of a heart attack. He was only, I think he was 57 years old. So, uh, his son, Russell, then took over, and I think he had a little bit of help or advice, whatever, from his mother, her name was Laura. And uh, he was partners with my grandfather for a few years. And I don't know if it wasn't his thing or what, what happened, but by 1948, he had decided that he, wa he wanted to move on to something else. So uh, that was when Ward Little came into the business. And Ward had actually worked there for many, many years before that. Off and on, he wasn't there full time because I don't think in those early years, like the mill, if it was running on water power, mm -hmm. you didn't have water power all year. So they would have a run winter, end of winter through the spring and into summer, probably as long as the water lasted. So uh, it wasn't wasn't full time. A little bit like it's not completely full time now. <laughs> so. Ward Little came in in 1948, and he and my grandfather were partners there for six years, and then my grandfather retired, and then my father came into the business in 1954, and Dad was saying that his timing wasn't really great. Well, I guess there's, there's one, I, I've left I guess I left the fire out right in between there. In 1944, there was the thought there was a fire too, which would have been four years before the war came in. And uh, Dad came in in 54, and then it burned again in 55. And he wondered how they were even going to survive at that time. Uh, there's a couple of things that made the timing hundreds. No good time for fire, I can vote for that. <laughs> but uh, nylon had just been invented and it was going to be it was going to revolutionize the world. There were so many things it could do. Except to realize that it couldn't keep you warm. <laughs> it would it would last forever, it would stand water, it would do a whole lot of things, but it couldn't keep you warm. <clears throat> and the price for wool had spiked just around that time. And so those combination of those two things, it, he, was, he was feeling pretty bleak about it. But as soon as the, the mill burned, they hired all of the men in the crew to go to the woods on the work lot and they started sawing lumber and made plans to build another mill. Some of us, we've never done anything else other than work in a woman mill. So, you know, whatever your age, you just, you don't know anything else, I guess. So, anyway, they actually sawed the lumber, cut the logs, sawed the lumber, and had the mill built and running in like 13 months. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of the local sawmills, they, they were hauling their logs in, and uh, Ward, Ward was the builder, so Ward made out the list of things, and he told, uh, and I think they probably used more than one mill, but I know one of the mills would have, would have been Brown's mill, it, there in York Mills, and uh, he said he needed 100,000 board feet of boards. And Sterling looked at him and he said, there's not room to pile 100,000 <laughs> boards in your mill. But I don't think we had any left over. And Ward was Scotch, so I'm sure he didn't have any more what he needed. So anyway, they, they, they built the mill and they had it up and running. And like I say, it was just, just over a year. Uh, of course, you're out of business for a year, so you're way behind, and uh, maybe people have found other suppliers, you're worried about that, but 
that happened to be a very booming time for wool. Now, I don't whether that had anything to do with nylon not being, I mean, it still had great features, but it, it didn't take over, it didn't hurt wool sales. So, uh, right around that time, uh, the uh, Mary Maxim sweaters, the ones with the, all the designs on them, became very popular. And Mary Maxim supplier couldn't keep up with the demand. So they contacted Bruce and Little. And uh, right after the mill got running, they started running a, an evening shift. They didn't run, it wasn't complete two shifts, but they ran. It seems to me it was from 6 o'clock till 9.30 or something. A lot of the people who worked at the mill had a farm too, so some of them had to get home and, and come back if, if they were going to do both shifts. And then they also hired on uh, quite a few new people. Uh, I keep looking at Ed because I remember his mom working there. She started working one of the night shifts in 57. And, uh, and there were several, actually there were several ladies that worked with me in the office and things too that started that. Jim Charter, and there were quite a few. They just worked till that contract was over. Well then when a job came up in the mill, then they, they came in and they worked uh, the, the regular shift. So uh, that all that all went quite well and, and things seemed to move along pretty good and uh, that particular type of yarn uh, we picked up a chain of stores in DC uh, Woodward stores and they had I think they had 20 or 25 stores and we private labeled for them so we put their own labels on it and they developed their own color line did some things like that like that and at that same time, this mill that was in St. Stephen closed. And Cottage Craft in St. Andrews had been running for a few years and all of their yarns had been made. The colors had been developed and they had been made in St. Stephen. So they approached Briggs and Little to see if they would produce their specific line of colors for them. And uh, that's when our association with them them started. So uh, that that was another bit of bit of business that was above and beyond just the regular because their color range was totally new to what to what we had been making. Um, after that um, there we had some yarn distributed in the US uh, by some people in uh, North Carolina and there was a lady from Connecticut who was an animator and she designed patterns and things like that and she wanted to have her own yarn. Well she found out about us and she found out about these people in uh, North Carolina that were distributing the yarn and so she and her husband decided they were going to buy them out and start doing and, uh, their own patterns with their own label and, and all of that and the name of that was Candide Yarns and uh, they did extremely well in fact they were our biggest customer you know, it took a bit of time, but they, they became our biggest customer. And at one point, they were probably about 35% of our total production. So, uh, we used to uh, ship to them every week, and it would be about 2,000 2, pounds. Sometimes we would get it in a week, sometimes it took a little bit longer, because we still had to do our own production as well. So... Uh, <coughs> I've actually showed some of the orders to some of the people that work at the mill now when they used to come in from them because we don't see anything like that anymore. I mean, everything's different. Nobody inventories a whole lot and all of that. So uh, they would order 
big quantities. The smallest amount they ever ordered of a collar was 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. so. How many skins are 1,200. <laughs> and that's one color. That's like, like the four or so in color that you could think of. That's what that was. The one that sold good, they ordered 500 pounds or 1,000. So, so <clears throat> they were a really good customer, and that continued uh, right up through into the uh, 70s. And, but this couple was getting older and they were ready to retire. So uh, there was a yarn salesman in the U.S. who took, uh, was interested in taking it over. He'd seen their yarns and he wanted, he was working as a sales rep and he wanted to get out working on his own. So he approached them for a few years trying to buy it out and eventually he did. Well, <clears throat> There was one piece of this puzzle that he didn't get all okay, and that was that he wanted to sell now his candied yarn, but he still wanted to keep on working for his other boss because that was a pretty lucrative job too. And his boss said, if you go into the store and you've got my yarn and you've got your yarn, who are you going to be pushing? Hardest. So he said, "The only he said I will do it, but the only way I'll do it is you bring your line in under ours, so that you're selling. Every everybody selling an equal playing field. Well, it's equal except that now we've got two middlemen in there instead of one, and and everybody needs something. So, uh, so it it was a bit of a battle, and it it, it never really worked out that well." <clears throat> And the biggest thing that was missing was that personal touch. Because uh, Brenda and I actually were around our 13th wedding anniversary because we went to Connecticut to meet with him. Because uh, John Thompson and I were trying to figure out what we're, <coughs> what our future is because this was, this was in the 70s somewhere. And, uh, Ward retired in 74, so it would have been before that, 72 or 3. Uh, and while we were there, the phone rang, and this lady's name was Joan McGarry. We went to the phone, and it was somebody who had one of her patterns from somewhere. She didn't go to a book, she didn't go to anything, but well, where are you in the pattern and what is it? And she talked her through it and she straightened it out. And, you know, there was, with this other company, with two layers in between people, there was none of that. And it, it just didn't have, it didn't have, I don't think, the same feel. And also, to be fair to that, uh, Times were changing too. There weren't as many. There weren't as many yarn shops. And uh, one of the interesting things about candy yarns was they they knew their demographics. They knew they knew what kind of towns or what kind of places the yarn, the wool yarn, would sell best. I've always noticed that it sells best around salt water because fishermen. They know they well. They got the wet mitts. They got these things. They know that they can still stay warm regardless of weather. Uh, and so, salt water or sailing places where sailing's popular, things like that. But McGarry's noticed that back in the fifties, sixties, and up into the seventies, a lot of female university students learned to knit because it was, a, it was a cheap pastime and they had something at the end of it that was functional or, or purpose. And they, they focused on that and they really did well. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's little things that you really maybe wouldn't stop to think about it. But after they told us that, we noticed in our shop that lots of times in September, October, when students were back at UMB in St. Thomas, there wouldn't be a lot of them, but there would be a 
couple of carloads or two or three, sometime through the fall, we come out like three or four of them get together to buy yarn and we'll be way back, way back to school to knit. So, uh, I don't know, it's, I guess, I've always loved my work and I've always found it fascinating um, and the people that I work with, whether it's in the mill or the customers, they're, they're, they're doing something that they love or are passionate about, and as long as you give them something that is good and reasonably priced, you're not, you're not going to hear a whole lot of flack. Or, so it's, it's been very satisfying that way. So, <clears throat> my born people, yeah, time, you mentioned John, right? Okay, well, I skipped up into those 70s, didn't I? I came to the mill in 1970, and uh, John Thompson came in 1971, and uh, he, he worked with his grandfather, and I worked with my dad. And uh, Ward worked until 1978, when he retired. And when he had a retirement, we gave him a plaque. He had more than 65 years, more than 60 years at Briggs and Little. And he was, he was only eight years old. Only 80 and worked for 60 years in one place. Uh, because he actually, there was a couple, he, he did leave a couple of times and try some other things. But, uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna get the baby there. <laughs> <laughs> so in '78, the the shares in Briggs and Little, uh, Briggs and Little became incorporated in 1960. So then there were some shares in the company. So oh, in hmm? oh, the no, not no, just just incorporated, oh, just incorporated. Yeah, no, we no, we're we're still we're still private, not public. Uh, so, Ward retired, and John Thompson took over his shares of the mill. My dad was still working, so I got half of his shares, so the two of us. So, basically, John Thompson had 50%, and Dad and I took 25 And that was for about six more years, till 84, and then Dad sold the rest of his shares. So, since 84, I did I was happening in John Thompson. In that time, there was a knitting craze come out called Loki Sweaters. <laughs> and in that time, anybody who made yarn could sell all of the yarn that they could make. Our mill is, uh, it needs a certain downtime for maintenance. In 82, when we normally, right now we have more maintenance time than we need, but in that time we didn't. And uh, there was one year we actually couldn't get caught up enough to shut down to do the maintenance. It was August before we did it. Now that was our old mill, the wooden, the wooden building, and it's not a nice place to be in July and August. <laughs> and, uh, but we were actually shipping like half a week. We went for two years and we never took on a new wholesale account. We, uh, we, we couldn't. We were shipping half orders to our existing customers, so it was, there was no point. And, uh, I actually had a lady come into the shop during that time. She was from somewhere in Ontario, maybe in Ottawa. And she said, I just stopped in here. I heard about you know, I just stopped in and I wanted to take the information back to my to the owner of our shop. I said, I'm sorry, I said, we, we can't take on any new wholesale accounts right now. She looked at me. She said, I'm going to tell them about this, 
but he's not going to believe it. If I came in here with a thousand dollars and said I want to buy yarn for my shop and would sell to me, I said no. I said I can't. I've got an order for somebody and I'm on, that has been my customer for 40 years and I'm only giving them half of what they're asking for. Now granted, we were half in orders to try and satisfy as many as we could, so no, people aren't dumb. No. <laughs> what do they do? They start ordering places. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I don't know if they thought they fooled us, but they really did. <laughs> so we that was a that was a trying time. And as far as times being tough, because we've seen some of them, especially since the last fire, I'll take that tough over the other one anytime because I found out real quick when when you can't supply somebody who has a business that is growing and like it's growing and it's working and they're wanting to do it. They can't afford to wait for you. And our meal wasn't such that we could just turn around and say, okay, I guess we'll make twice as much yarn. Uh, our meal was, at that time, was old. It was wooden framed. It was on four floors. It just wasn't conducive to trying to run two full shifts or, or whatever. If we did that, then the maintenance would just probably go from six weeks yeah. to 12 weeks yeah. or whatever in the summer. Uh, so uh, it was it was it was really tough. And we we had we had some customers who had the potential to be wonderful customers and we just we just weren't able to supply it. And that's really hard mm -hmm. to, to see that. I had one lady from Quebec. She'd be on the phone, she'd be crying to me. Be <laughs> she, because she had an idea and it worked. And it was going great guns. And now what do I do? Like, where do I go? Or whatever. It's just, and couldn't give her, couldn't give her an answer. So. How many bone mills are there in Canada or New Brunswick? Right? There's one in New Brunswick. <laughs> 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 and it's down the road. <laughs> yeah. And there's one in PEI. There are none now in Nova Scotia. There's none in Newfoundland. There's one that I know of in Quebec. Now, once we go beyond there, there, there can be textile mills that are maybe producing, but they're maybe not producing wool. I don't pay much attention to the ones who aren't focused mostly on wool, so there could be. Uh, Places that are making acrylic yarns or, or some other form of synthetic. And now there are also many uh, mini mills which are low production, but they usually use more expensive fiber like alpaca or something like that. So, so where, where does your raw wool come from? We buy as much local as we can, but. Uh, there's a co-op in Ontario that buys from all over Canada, so what, what we can't get locally. And we don't try to buy direct from producers too far away because we have tried that in the past and we get we can get burnt. Mm -hmm. Because if wool isn't right for making the yarn that we make, we have no use for it. Mm -hmm. So if it's a large quantity and it's come from far away, mm -hmm. It's wool's raw wool isn't that expensive or that it's going to be worthwhile to ship it back again, like ship it both ways. So, uh, so we buy the Brunswick, uh, we get a bit from Maine and New Hampshire because there's a shear down there that we buy from, and we know what we get from her, we can depend on. I get some from Nova Scotia. We used to get some from Newfoundland, we used to get a lot from Newfoundland, and it was just a little vague. <laughs> and they wanted full skeins of yarn or whatever it would make, and that was all the time. And postage got so expensive. Now that postage is dimensioned, like uh, it's because of volume, not the weight, 
then it just totally, mm -hmm. like, they can actually go to the store in Newfoundland and buy it cheaper than they can send us the wool and us send them there and back. Mm -hmm. But that was a very interesting time, and it was a lot of business, too. I remember when I was a kid at home, every spring, they and um, by spring, I guess it'd be before spring, because before wool shearing time came, they sent out a newsletter to all the customers from the year before that had sent wool in. And I can remember there being like between five and 10,000 letters that would be sent out. And it was just a, a eight and a half by 14 sheet with the, what the price of wool would be for that year and what it was to uh, do certain steps in the processing or whatever. And uh, they had some of them to do that the, our kids, we, you know, you see these ads where you want to make money stuffing envelopes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got any envelope. <laughs> <laughs> for stuffing them. So, uh, I don't remember making a lot of money doing that. I don't know. I wasn't as much interested. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, that, I guess, takes us up to John Thompson's time, and we've gone through the Loki craze and Candy Garns, and uh, so after the Loki craze, it things started slowing down. Well, you all know after there's been a peak and then it starts mm -hmm. slowing down, you think, oh, that's not good, and that's not good, like. So, by the late 80s, like 88, 89, we felt that we had to do something because our production year was dropping down. We were, at one point, we were between six and seven months of production in a year. And so, we uh, approached some uh, government marketing agencies and had a they, did us want to do a study and all of this stuff. So we we got involved with that and the company that we dealt with, they were really impressed because you know the first thing was to contact our customer list and see what can this company do to make their yarns more appealing and easier to sell or whatever. And they said that they had never in their marketing history seen customers that were so anxious to try and offer help to somebody as well. Mm -hmm. as well. I mean, it was it was really encouraging what came back from them, and and good ideas. And at that point, uh, we changed our labels, put more information because we just had a label that didn't have a die lot number. It didn't have. It just told you the size of the yarn. It didn't even tell you the color. So they developed something like that and also um, stitch gauge for people so that you could compare it to another pattern and so that you could substitute it in and, and a few patterns. That's when we came out with, with some patterns. We have, we, have some, we have some pattern people here. <laughs> the first sweater pattern we ever had. <clears throat> the front cover is in the audience tonight. <laughs> it looks the same. Yes, they do. <laughs> Mill, Mill and Norm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, we, we had one pattern before that, but that was for socks. And that, <laughs> that, uh, that also had local people now who are all now grown up, moms and dads, grams and gramps, and all of that. And that was for our, that was for a song. So uh, that got us started doing a little pattern support and expanding on that. And it uh, it really helped. And another thing they did, they you know, they suggested that we go to trade shows. So we started going to trade shows. Uh, first ones were in Toronto, and it worked quite well. Uh, it was gratifying the number of people that we stopped your booth, and at least they were talented. 
the, the name or whatever. Uh, so we started in 1990, and they say that you got to go to the same market like three times before it starts to come. To you. Well, so do the math. We went 1990, 91, 92, 93 is coming pretty good. 94 is great guns. November 1st, 1994, the oh. <laughs> It was, we were, we were on track for the best, best year that we had ever had. Because of the fire, we actually had the best year we ever had, because then everybody wanted a yarn, because there wasn't going to be any more. <laughs> so, it, uh, it was, uh, it was bad. There's no other way to say it. And uh, that, but we still had all of that marketing information and all of that stuff. Uh, the problem was to get rebuilt. rebuilt. It took time. Uh, we sourced, it, it burned November 1st. By April, we had found enough equipment and had secured some funding and some help from the provincial government to know that we could do it. Uh, but we had no idea what, how poor the condition was because when we went looking for a machine, we were looking for specific machines, but if a mill had four carding machines and they were willing to sell one, they didn't sell us the best one. You know? <laughs> so it took a long time once the mill was set up. We were, we were nowhere on track like the old guys who went to the woods with the buck saw. <laughs> uh, it took us over two years. So it was May of 97 before we were actually back producing, producing the uh, But we had a nice new building and we had a lot of stuff there. It was, it was a hard two years for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, Johnny was traveling all over the country looking for machinery. And I was in the office looking after assistants, banks, brokerage, like getting stuff, <coughs> trucking companies getting stuff shipped. And it, I actually, Look through some of those file folders just a while ago because I've been going through some of the things I've accumulated <laughs> over 48 years there. Almost 49. Almost 49. And uh, uh, I I couldn't do it then. I know I know it. And uh, there was times after we decided to build that. Johnny said, if he had known, because he designed, he designed the mill, like our old mill, every time they bought a new machine, they had to add a new shed roof and a new floor and a new stuff, like we had roofs and floors and things going everywhere. And so yarn was started here and it went to there and then it went to there and then it went. so, and the machines are big and they're heavy and you couldn't you couldn't change that. So at least with this new building, it the flow was straightened out and it was good. So uh, there are blessings, but it took over 20 years. I always felt that it took us 20 years to get back to where we were in 1994. And by then, Johnny was ready to retire. <laughs> so, um, that's, that's the story up until 2014. And uh, Johnny retired at the end of 2014. And uh, in January of 2015, Mike became my partner, so he and I have been running it since then. 
and um, Brenda's been after me for quite a few years wondering when I'm going to retire. <laughs> and one Sunday morning, about three or four years ago, we're having a cup of coffee, and I said, How about the year that I turned 70, I retire, we sell our house, and we move to the lake? That was quite a lot to feed her all the <laughs> Anyway, uh, she latched on mostly to the date. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my birthday is at the end of May, and I will be 70. So that is, that is when I plan to retire. And since last May, Mike's wife, Lydia, has been working with me. She's here. <laughs> I know that. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Hi. So she has joined us, and she and the other girls in the office are more pecky, more like <laughs> There's been a huge difference in uh, <clears throat> social media presence. We had hired a company two years ago when we had done stuff with that, but it's that they've added a whole new dimension to it now, and it's it's really getting our name out there. And uh, it's when when you're trying to expand your business like ours as a manufacturer, uh, what you're really looking for is wholesale customers. But before the wholesale customers are interested. There need to be some consumers that are familiar or are looking for it too. So that is the place to me that the social media is. It's getting to the in, to the individuals, and they're going to say, "Oh, I like this stuff. We're going to get a little bit." So uh, they have done an amazing job at that, and it's uh, it seems to be working out quite well. Now. I keep looking down, but I really don't read anything. <laughs> so there are a couple of things that I bypassed, and I, I guess I just really would, would like to make note. I can do it very quickly. It's four minutes eight, so I've been babbling for almost an hour, and I I can finish it up. I think in those four minutes. I'll 